So good morning, evening, afternoon. Yes, today we are going to talk a little bit about quercetin. I had uh, promised to do that before. We're going to talk a little bit more about chloroquine and clarify some of the things that have come out about that. But I am going to cover a couple of times uh, some emotional components. And it's not just emotional components. These are life or death, death components. Boris Johnson came out and said, look, you must stay at home. 20% of the, uh, of the world's population right now is on a significant lockdown. The UK is not used to that. He said, basically, don't do any of this except for shopping for groceries, essentials, medical need, one form of exercise per day, traveling to and from work if it's absolutely necessary that you not work from home. Again, as usual, the images aren't great here, but things don't look good right now. I think we should acknowledge that. You know, you've seen, we've all seen, most of us, if you haven't seen this meme, then, or this cartoon, you should have seen it before. It's that frog who's, who uh, is about to be swallowed by the stork. And you know where that's coming from. But then uh, we talk about doing anything you can not to give up. Well, that sounds cute unless you're the frog. And a lot of people are saying, you know what? That's just not reality. Well, here's the thing. Neville Chamberlain said that uh, what Winston Churchill said was not reality. The German war machine prior to World War II, or at the beginning of World War II, had marched all the way through France and was ready to take over the world, starting with Europe. Winston Churchill said, never give up. And it turned out, even though he was being totally unrealistic by all rational moment, uh, minds at the moment, he was right. Now, what we do over the next three weeks to a month is going to be very important. Uh, it will depend. It will determine who's going to be here next Christmas, Kwanzaa, Ramadan, Hanukkah. Again, the decisions that we make over the next few weeks. And I'll go a little bit deeper in talking about that and give some personal examples with myself, with my own family, other members, uh, some viewers that have made comments. Um, <clears throat> I don't usually recommend... Um, I'm, I'm not an anarchist, but sometimes uh, you get some advice that from authority figures that may not be the greatest. I don't think we're going to end up having a, a statement that we really should stop social distancing over the next week. If we do, I would ask you to reconsider again the next two to four weeks. I mean, this is a this is a hundred year um, outbreak, a hundred year epidemic. Those of us who swim in these waters, focus on epidemic management, uh, deal with public health, preventive medicine, we've been waiting for this. And again, if you don't believe that, just get the book by Osterholm, Michael Osterholm, chapter 13, Deadliest Enemy. He predicted this whole thing. And again, he's not alone. It's been predicted. We've known it was coming. A lot of warning signals were sent out, but obviously they weren't heated the way they could have been. Had they been, there would be a lot more people alive right now. And guess what? There's still time for a whole lot of us. And we're most of us will be here. Not all of us will be here next holiday, but most of us will. And uh, who's here depends a lot on the actions that we take over the next, again, two to four weeks. This two to four week period is going to be critical in terms of our survival. And it's really not going to depend on zinc quercetin. It's not going to depend on azithromycin, a Z-pack. It's not going to depend on chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Those might help in some situations. It's not even going to really depend on testing at this point. Again, at this point, it's going to depend on whether or not you're in a position of getting the virus. It's all about transmission right now. Speaking of transmission, there was a great article in the New England Journal this week about uh, early transmission dynamics. Again, it's one of these many articles, a lot of this great research on what, what's been happening happened at the original epicenter in Wuhan the first few weeks by some great epidemiologists, some great Chinese doctors that were there and recorded what happened. So 
what did they do? Early transmission dynamics in Wuhan, China. They collected information on demographic uh, characteristics, exposure history, and il illness timelines of the laboratory confirmed cases. There were 425 patients in this original study. The median age was 59 years. And you, you know, you keep hearing, well, it's mostly males. It's predominantly males. It's a lot of males, 56% males. It's not, I mean, it's not that big of a, of a focus. The majority of these cases were onset before January uh, 1 of this year and were linked to the Hanan sea, uh, seafood wholesale market as compared with 8.6 of the subsequent cases. So yes, the, that's where the finger point or the pinpoint on that, that wet market happened. Here's a critical piece. The mean incubation period, 5.2 days and the 95th percentile distribution at 12.5 days. Let me repeat that. Results of the 425 patients, the mean incubation period was 5.2 days and the 95th percentile, uh, 95th percentile uh, of the distribution was 12.5. So what does that mean and why is that important for us right now? What can we learn from that? Well, I'm gonna go into personal examples about going into uh, social distancing, isolation, and going back out to get groceries. When did you go out to get groceries last? When's your next trip to the groceries? You've got a 19 and 20 chance of knowing whether or not, you, if you're going to get this, if you got this the last time you were at the grocery store, you're going to know within about two weeks. So that's one of the reasons that I keep saying the next two to four weeks are critical. The other reasons why I say that, I'll talk about it in just a minute. In fact, let's do that right now. Here's why I, another of the reasons why I say the next two weeks are, are critical. Here's the, the map. It's a little bit easier to follow. And right now the, the Hopkins COVID-19 tracker keeps spinning on me. It's, I think it's uh, struggling right now to keep up or there may be a problem with it. This one is, uh, this Bing tracker uh, gives you a little bit more headlines, a little bit more of the news, and it gives you some information uh, that is helpful to know about what's going on with the disease in this, the pandemic in this world right now. As you see, obviously the big, the big uh, red dot in China, growth in the Middle East and the, the big red dot in Iran, Italy and Europe, again, the epicenter of active cases right now. But as we said yesterday, it appears to me that the uh, perhaps the epicenter of transmission may be the United States at this point. Look at the uh, increase in cases. This was uh, back when the, when it was in uh, Wuhan in China. And again, this is what's happening now. What, 30 to 35 new cases each day, 30 to 35,000 new cases each day for the past three days. So again, what you do when you consider these numbers and what's going on in the world outside your home, especially if you're in the US right now, what you do over the next two to four weeks is critical to which, uh, which whether you and your, which of, of you and your family members are here over the next holiday period. So again, <clears throat> be careful about advice to, uh, be careful about the assumptions that you make. Again, I'll get a little bit deeper into some of those assumptions. I've been making the rounds, calling my family members and just checking on their assumptions. And we get some interesting ones. Some of the decisions that we make to get out there are not so easy. For example, healthcare workers or food supply workers, grocery workers. If they don't go to work, the food supply shuts down. Friends, I've got people who are helping set up uh, national uh, coronavirus testing programs. If they don't do their work, the testing programs don't happen. The te if the testing programs don't happen, then we can't, uh, we can't find clusters. We can't find outbreaks. We can't find places to quarantine. And this killer continues to ripple through the population. Again, mostly from people that have no clue that they have any infection. They're not symptomatic. They don't have symptoms. They don't know that they were even exposed. So go back through uh, some of the things that we plan to cover over the rest of the uh, of the presentation. As I promised a couple of times, yes, a lot of 
questions and focus about zinc quercetin. I looked up a few things on zinc quercetin. I'll cover some quercetin questions, what it is, why it's interesting, why it's why a lot, why a lot of people are asking about it. We'll talk about the new source for hydroxychloroquine, fish tank cleaning supplies. Don't do it, by the way. It's already killed a couple of people. And again, talk a little bit more about uh, family decisions, testing updates, thing like, things like that. So quercetin, why is quercetin a, a big issue right now? What's the, what's the deal behind quercetin? So coronavirus hijacks our genetic, our, our cells' genetic materials. So we use DNA to, it's the, the head, the, the control center of the cell. It tells us what proteins to make and then the proteins do the work. So the generals within the cell are the DNA or the genetic material. That's always the case, no matter which biological entity you're looking at or species. Now, again, a virus is really just a, usually protein coding, uh, coding capsule with some genetic material in it. It's almost like a hypodermic. And inside that hypodermic, um, there's genetic material that goes into your cell and it hijacks your own genetic material. So what does coronavirus do? It goes in and, and shuts down some of our DNA uh, genetic mechanisms and takes it over for its own RNA. It's an RNA virus. You don't need to know the differences between DNA and RNA. But it hijacks, again, our genetic mechanisms to start making RNA, which in turn makes more and more copies of the, the coronavirus shell and the coronavirus RNA. And then it assembles those two, spews those back out. And now instead of having the virus that or virion that uh, infected the cell, now there are tens, thousands, millions of them to go out and infect other cells. Now, in order to do that, there's an enzyme that, uh, that it needs to, uh, to hijack this and start increasing the RNA production. That enzyme, again, geeky, long geeky term, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Now, here's the thing, zinc slows down that, uh, that enzyme. It inhibits the uh, RNA polymerase. So where does quercetin come in? That's zinc, right? So zinc is a, an ion. It's got a, a two plus for the chemists out there. And ions don't go very well through cell membranes. Cell membranes are mostly made of cholesterol. That's where some of these people, uh, you hear some of these people say, cholesterol is not bad. In fact, it's a major building block. Pardon me for touching my face. So what do you do then? H how does this, uh, how can we stop the virus? Well, if we could get a lot of zinc into that cell, through that cell membrane, we would slow down that RNA dependent RNA polymerase and slow down this process. So that's why so many people are asking about this. It's, you see, it turns out that uh, quercetin is an ionophore. Uh, ionophores actually help get those ions through those cell membranes. And I may have misspelled that. Fact check me and correct me if I did. Speaking of ionophores, that's where chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine come in. We'll talk about those again a little bit later. So here is quercetin, the molecular structure on the left, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, the molecular structures on the right. You know, they sort of look like chicken wire, right? Uh, I didn't have time. I meant to go ahead and get yet another molecular structure to show you. Uh, many of the chemists and biologists know where I'm going already. The classic, quote, chicken wire molecule is cholesterol. So these look a little bit like a cholesterol mo molecule. They are reminiscent. Maybe that has something to do with getting zinc as an ionophore process through that cholesterol membrane. That's why there's so much focus. And yes, quercet quercetin is not new. It's something that's been uh, used for quite a while. Um, the research is not that great yet on most things, but there is some significant signals within the science that quercetin is an anti-inflammatory, used for cardiovascular inflammation, used for uh, immunity, and especially, I think, for uh, bladder cancer. Very interesting components with quercetin. What is it? It's a what's called a plant flavonoid. What's a flavonoid? I think I might skip that for right now. 
Uh, what's it used for? Again, as we mentioned before, heart and vessel problems, lowering blood pressure, prostate infections, preventing upper uh, respiratory infections, allergies, disease prevention. Why, why do people take it? Again, that's why they take it. Does it work? Again, uh, there's some moderate science uh, signals out there. Uh, somebody asked me yesterday, how much do you take when you do take it? The standard that you tend to see with most of these supplements is 500 milligrams per day. And as I mentioned here, there's some uh, fairly good uh, hard science regarding anti-cancer and anti-metastasis functions for human bladder cell cancers. Flavus, what does Flavus mean? Flavus is a Latin word for yellow. These are, for the chemists, uh, they're polyphenols, uh, and they're basically metabolites from other plant processes. As you've seen, as I've been going through these slides, there's a bunch of different sources for it. You see it a lot in different fruits and vegetables. Each of these pictures that I'm showing on the side here are plant sources for flavonoids. They have two phenyl rings and a heterocyclic ring, for again, for the uh, chemistry geeks. We'll look later and see if we have a lot of questions or concerns or uh, <clears throat> other issues about flavonoids and zinc quercetin. Now, let's go back to something we've mentioned before. So quercetin, yeah, it may help. Is it worth going to the grocery store uh, to get quercetin? I don't think so. Am I going to leave and go get quercetin? No. Do I have quercetin at home? No. I do have some zinc, again, as I mentioned yesterday. One of our volunteers uh, sent me some zinc. Someone was asking recently, what, which salt is it? So you've got cations and anions. The cations have the T in them so that they have a positive charge. The anions have a negative charge. They have an N in them. The uh, anion on this one is zinc gluconate. Do I know specifically that that is the best one? I don't. Am I spending a lot of time investigating that? Frankly, I'm not because what am I spending my time on? I'm spending my time talking with friends, families, and loved ones, people that I work with and asking them some questions about their assumptions right now. And we'll get into those assumptions. Uh, someone asked yesterday, well, what about hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, the ZPAC? And those of you who heard the president of the United States, I believe it was last night, he was praising that combination, talking about how great that was going to be. Some people have uh, have died from it already. As one of our friends, one of our viewers pointed out yesterday, both of these drugs are known to prolong the QT interval. It's a, it's the time that the charge, the contraction of the heart, the electrical beat goes from the Q, which is the beginning of the beat uh, in the ventricles or the signal to, to beat in the ventricles and then the, the T, which is depolarization. Bottom line is, yes, this is not a, an innocuous drug, hydroxychloroquine. This couple evidently found out that hydroxychloroquine was in their, um, the chemical used to uh, clean their fish tank. So they decided to take it prophylactically. I've mentioned that I've prescribed hydroxychloroquine in a couple of situations. I'm not encouraging taking hydroxychloroquine prophylactically, except in some fairly unusual conditions like healthcare providers. And um, again, not in, not uh, prophylactically in all healthcare providers. And I think they have, still might be off label right now. I would be very concerned, very uh, nervous about using it. As we've said, there've been deaths already. <clears throat> Back to the, to the real issue, the most important issue for all of us right now during this ugly two to four week period. I'm not saying we're even going to get out at the end of two to four weeks. What I am saying is that we'll know we'll be in a very different world two to four weeks from now. So we know we're going into that space. The most important two to four weeks of this hundred year experience. So really be focused, really be thinking about this. Don't think so much about zinc quercetin. Don't think so much about supplements. Don't think so much about dog food. Don't think so much about groceries. Don't think so much about uh, if you'd like to see your family members right now. All, all of those are very important things. Please think about getting through as much as you can for the next two to four weeks with as little potential exposure as you can. Because again, these are going to be critical weeks in terms of avoiding this virus. So we had a, a viewer yesterday who said, is it worth it? I'm miserable. 
I want to see my family. I've been out here and I, he didn't explain where he was. He didn't explain why, uh, why he's been out here. He, he didn't explain why he could not see his family. But again, for the next two weeks, part of the reason why people are making assumptions that just don't make sense is because we haven't had a situation in this world for a hundred and what? 102 years that we have right now. When was the last time there was a very real, real possibility of dying as going, dying as a result of going to the grocery store, dying as, as the result of shaking hands from someone, dying as the result of going to get gasoline in your car. Now, of course, yes, there's a possibility of dying in car wrecks and things like that. And of course we could always get run over by a bus, but those were not practical considerations. The last time this was a practical consideration was, 102 years ago, 1918, with the Spanish flu. So speaking of family members, we've, we're locked away in the, in the lake house. So uh, this was one group I talked to. There was a 70-year-old male, 67-year-old female, 89-year-old female. All of that was good. They, had, they were there. They also had a 15-year-old uh, male and a 12-year-old female. There was also a mother in the generation in between those two generations. Actually, there are four generations there. And I began to ask the question, okay, so where's the mom, the 30 year old? And the answer was, well, she brought the two kids in a couple of days ago. So I'm going back to the New England Journal article. So, okay, so they've had a couple of days. Um, five days is the median for if they, if they brought infection with them. So they could clearly, clearly no evidence at this point that we don't have infection. Um, and again, it's going to be what? It's going to be two weeks of them being isolated before we know for sure that they haven't had exposure to this virus. So then you ask the next question. Well, and by the way, the mom's coming to pick the kids up again in a couple more days. I know I'm touching my hands. I know I'm, I'm not I'm doing things that I shouldn't do either. But again, I start to get concerned about is that worth it? And here's the next question. How about dad? Dad is working in a factory, going in every day. And yes, of course, they're taking temperatures, but dad's working in a factory. What is the factory? Let's make an assumption that the factory is for Tyvek and that that Tyvek is being used now to make uh, gowns for PPE, personal protective equipment. But it's important for mom to see dad, right? And it's important for mom to see the kids, right? And it's important for the kids to stay isolated with grandma and granddad and great grandma. Let's again consider that it's never been the case for 100 years, but it is the case over the next two to four weeks. This kind of mixing can result in transmission of this virus. So let's reconsider our assumptions. Call another one. Oh, we've been locked in for three weeks. We're good. And uh, we actually well, went, went, went to get groceries last week, a couple of days ago, and forgot to get dog food. So I'm going to have to go back in in a couple of days. And I'm going, it's great that we're, that we're locked in and we've got enough food for three weeks. But how about the dogs eating table scraps for a few weeks? I mean, just this next two to four weeks, guys. And had silence for a few minutes. And they said, well, I've got four dogs. <laughs> We don't have that many table scraps, uh, you know. Well, maybe we could think a little bit more about that. And again, sure enough, I got a text a while back, uh, a little bit later, saying, "You know what? Thanks for bringing that up. We ordered out. Uh, we ordered delivery for dog food." Speaking of which, you know, what about delivery? What about things? So, I'm still ordering things by delivery uh, uh, instead of going to someplace like a grocery store. I'm still living off of um, mostly uh, olive oil and avocado oil and putting it on different things to sort of help change the taste. Janice is uh, getting things at the grocery, which I'm not, not too happy about, obviously. And you know what? The first time she got groceries, neither one of us thought about wiping, the, wiping things off after she brought them in. She did think about uh, not touching the bags. And after we thought about it later, there's a lot more risk from what's in the grocery uh, from the covers of the groceries than what's in the bags. This is totally unprecedented. And what we do over the next two to four weeks is going to be critical to our survival. So please think about it. 
How about uh, serving meat in a grocery store? Another another uh, person very near to us, still going into work every day, four or five days a week at least. And, uh, you know, we started to raise the question of, you know, what? why don't you develop a cough? Uh, or why don't you consider whether or not it's worth it? Because again, the next two to four weeks are critical. We had to call, we had to call back later on and say, you know what? I've been in I've been in that turn as well. I used to be an ER doc and I would have gotten up and gone to work. So there are times we, we make decisions that uh, risk ourselves and our families. We should just at least make it with full knowledge. And I think if we're talking about seeing mom and dad, we know we can see them again within a few weeks or especially getting dog food or getting carbs because we think we need to have carbs in our diet or getting whatever was favorite, reconsider whether those are really necessary again for the next two to four weeks. Am I saying, and just as a repetition, am I saying that we're going to be fine two to four weeks from now? No, I'm not saying that. I am saying that the picture will be very, very different two to four weeks from now. You and I both know that. So again, think about the assumptions that you're using to make your decisions right now. Healthcare workers are going with full-blown diabetes are going into work. We know that they're making some brave decisions to uh, sacrifice themselves or risk sacrifices them, to risk themselves to help others, to help their patients, public safety workers, public health workers. Uh, James, my partner on the, one of my partners on this uh, national testing program, he's, uh, he's getting a lot of exposure right now, sourcing gowns and gloves and masks. So, as I've said, this is hard. Mistaken assumptions can kill us. And the next few weeks are critical for our survival. For those of who of us who are going to be around this coming holiday, question, is it safe to, the, to go to the grocery store? Is it safe to go get the mail? Is it safe to go to the coffee shop? Speaking of an update on the testing program, well, we got, I've been talking uh, with a lot of, uh, what's the word? A lot of confidence in our partners at the lab that yes, they've been consistent. We're going to have, no, we don't have labs today, but we will have lab kits this coming Wednesday. Well, today is Tuesday and last night we heard, no, we don't have uh, 10,000 lab kits available. We've got five and we don't, are not going to have 5,000, 10,000 a day available for you. And we're not sure how many we're going to have available. So, even though it's a national lab partner, even though they were adamant and very sure and have been consistent up until last night that they were going to have lab kits starting tomorrow, doesn't look like that's happening right now. And we've been working, as I've shared with you, one of my own personal risk concerns was I almost made the decision to go out and make a, a training film for, for the people who would be delivering this test and doing the uh, the test sampling. I felt like it was, it might be worth the risk. They were going to, they got a 5,000 square foot studio. It was going to be just me and a videographer. And we were going to do the gown daff, uh, donning and doffing. That's putting it on, you know, putting the stuff on the gown, the gloves, the mask and the, and the shield, and then taking them off. Then I thought again, and I said, you know what, these next two weeks are critical. So, Let's take the content that we already have, take some content off of the internet. And there are a bunch of hospitals making a bunch of that content right now on the internet. So we're going to be taking that and using it. And we're doing some things which will help and improve this and make this high quality video. But again, so then we go to get the gowns to, uh, to, to do some of this and uh, there are no gowns. The hospitals have overordered. Their suppliers have overordered for them. And oh, by the way, they're sourced from China. The masks are sourced from China. The, whether these are all actually sourced from China, uh, and whether I've, you know, I heard the president last night say that we're breaking open. We've got pallets after pallet after pallet of the national stock that we're releasing. Whether any of those are true, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But. Are we uh, going to be up and rolling? People are stockpiling. We're hearing that. And yes, our president's new best friend, uh, friend of me, uh, was up announcing what the attorney general would do for stockpiling. 
and uh, profiteering based on this activity. But again, things are over ordered. We're not accessing gloves, PPE, gowns, and for sure in 95 masks. I had a, um, a viewer comment the, the, uh, yesterday that she was helping make N95 masks, sewing them herself. And I just, I thought that was interesting, neat, and it threw me for a second, but it just showed me how out of touch I was with what's going on with sourcing right now. Just a brief comment about labs, just a reminder, you hear a lot of stuff about the immediate lab, the immediate lab, the immediate lab, the self-testing lab. I get a lot of questions about that. That's an antibody test. It's similar to what you see with the home pregnancy test. It's going to be great when we get past the next two to four weeks or maybe longer, because then the question is going to be very, very different. It's going to be, when can I come out? We're going to be, it's like spring is going to, you know, the nuclear winter is going to have gone and spring is coming out and we're actually beginning to start thinking about when can we come out? When reconfigure, restart the economy? When can we restart our lives? And at that point, we want to know if we have an antibody. Uh, right now, that's not that helpful. Right now, we need to know who's got the virus. And those are two different things. If you go back, you remember it's up to two weeks before people start the incubation period. Now, what's not clear and what was not shown in that was how long does it take you from the time of infection to the time that you form an antibody? Here's the big question. How much virus do you have building up in your body before you show a positive antibody? That is the critical question for us at this stage in the pandemic. And we don't know the answer to that yet. Why are we using the other test? That's why. The test is called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. It's basically looking at the DNA or the genetic material, which is actually RNA that we talked about in the very beginning of this discussion. Um, the, the RNA for coronavirus, we're looking at PCR. That takes a couple of days. How you do that lab is this, you take the sample out, you put it in, in areas, you add some things to, and heat it up, incubate it. And it, um, that polymerase chain reaction creates more and more of that coronavirus RNA. Again, that's where some of the problem gets back to test kit issues. The CDC is responsible when these uh, types of, of uh, epidemics come through. They're responsible for sourcing the actual infectious agent, breaking it down, developing DNA tests, which will help, or excuse me, genetic material tests, which will help us detect that genetic material once we amplify it in lab. And that's what we're all waiting for in terms of those testing. So don't really, I, I don't know, I, I haven't seen anybody getting access yet. I think if, if people were out there accessing the antibody tests right now, uh, you would see it on the internet. I'm not seeing it yet. Don't confuse the two tests and don't assume that, oh, I'm negative on the antibody test, that immediate home test. So therefore I'm not infectious and I don't have it. That's a different question for a different time. That's when we're starting to get out of this. Right now, we're going into it. There's nothing like a community. We saw that in the Louisville event. People got together and started talking about how they've had challenges and successes in preventing their own heart attack, stroke, or chronic disease. It became very clear that <clears throat> You don't have to be a doc with a full-time 30-year career in preventive medicine to understand this and successfully prevent heart attack, stroke, the number one killer and disablers of people. You don't have to be a physician to prevent eye disease, uh, kidney disease. All you have to do is think, listen, and become part of the community. Now, how do you do that? Go to the membership login on our webpage, and as you can see, you can get right in. You have, you have to sign up if you haven't signed up already, and I've already signed up. I've already gone in. It's very simple, very uh, easy to understand. In order to help encourage this, after the success and the positive emotion, the positive impact that we're seeing with these events, we're saying, look, we need to offer more of these services for free in order to help grow this community. So you'll see us starting to do drawings for the webinar event, the courses, 
we've got a book coming out in a, in about a month. Uh, we'll be offering that. Even full-blown evaluations, providing those uh, for free for folks that, again, help us grow the community. So if you'd like to find out what the most recent rules are for the most recent drawing, just come to the membership page. Thank you for your interest.